Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's virtual open house to discuss the Sny Point Outdoor Event Space Project. Uh, my name is Megan Langell and I'm a strategist with public engagement with the RMWB and I'm very excited to be hosting tonight's virtual open house. Um, prior to starting the meeting, I did want to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on Treaty 8 territory, the traditional lands of the Cree Dene and the unceded territory of the Métis. Before we get started, I just want to note that we have prepared and rehearsed, but uh, we may still have some technical issues. So please do bear with us as we through, work through anything that may come up. Uh, if for some reason your connection is lost, there is another way to listen in. The dial-in phone number and conference ID will be available for viewing within the Q&A chat. Feel free to write that down in case you do have internet interference, you can connect back with us uh, via mobile. Let me give you um, a quick overview of the agenda for this evening and introduce a couple of key people joining us for this event. Joining me, uh, I have Stephen Fudge, who's our manager of public works, as well as Maureen Nowakowski, project manager of engineering with the RMWB. Um, I also have Josh Bernstein on the line, project manager with Lees and Associates. And the consultant team uh, from Urban Systems, Greg Kahn is on the line, and I have Yvonne Batista and James Roche with D DTAH. In just a minute, I will invite um, Stephen to give us more background information about the Sny Point Outdoor Event Space and the overall Waterfront Park Revitalization Project. Then the team will be presenting two concept designs and provide some additional details after which uh, we will open the floor to your questions. So the um, concept designs have been available for viewing um, for the public in the last week, but tonight we're really gonna go into detail of those specific concept designs with the designers themselves. Um, and throughout the presentation, the Q&A chat feature is available for you to ask questions. So please feel free to provide those throughout uh, the presentation as we can still see them. To protect all participants, uh, privacy uh, for your microphones and cameras have been disabled. And again, to protect your privacy, the Q&A chat viewing capability is disabled for participants. However, municipal staff can view all comments submit, submitted through the Q&A chat. Um, and I did want to let you know that this evening's event will be posted to armwb.ca slash waterfront uh, for your review later and share, of course. Now, let me uh, invite Stephen Fudge to introduce himself and the work that brings us here tonight. Stephen? So hello everyone, my name is Stephen Fudge. I'm the Parks Manager with the Parks Branch of Public Works. And we're the service delivery uh, department responsible for the waterfront revitalization project. The Sny Point Indoor Event Space is a priority of Council Strategic Plan for 2018-21 and is part of the overall waterfront park revitalization project. It's also supported by the Parks Master Plan. And I want to provide some details in regard to the waterfront revitalization project as it's divided into two priorities. The project that we're speaking of this evening will focus on the design and construction of the year-round Sny Point Outdoor Event Space in 2021. The other portion of the overall project will focus on the remaining design and construction of the waterfront park. And, and this project will take a look at the land and public engagement, which will occur later in 2021. And a little bit more on the council motion. On March 10th, 2020, Mayor and Council unanimously carried a motion directing administration to undertake a project in 2020 to incorporate a year-round designated outdoor event space, which included supporting facilities and appropriate utilities. This project's location is at the site of many past community events at the SNI, such as Winter, Winter Play, Ignite, Rib Fist, Athabasca Tribal Council's Cultural Festival, and the future site of the 20. 22 Arctic Winter Games, or whenever that's post reconvenes. So the goal this evening is to provide an event space, uh, to speak to you about uh, providing an event space to host a year-round outdoor event, uh, events of various sizes while creating a pedestrian connections along the waterfront. Uh, 
thank you for this opportunity. And with that, I'll pass this over to James. Actually, maybe James can continue to share and I can uh, uh, present. Um, okay. We will be going through the agenda on the screen there is to talk about the project boundary and the background. We'll talk about the guiding principles which help to frame the design, we'll speak about the master plan design elements, uh, the concept plans, some diagrams that dissect those plans to help explain what's happening, and then we'll speak about next steps and get into some discussion. Uh, so we'll just talk about the project boundary. Um, as Stephen mentioned, there's the larger waterfront park, which is a six kilometer long uh, waterfront project. We're going to be speaking today about one part of that uh, larger master plan, which is the Sny Point outdoor event space, which is located on the right side of the screen by Sny River and Clearwater River. Next slide. So what we need to understand is to gather your feedback and your thoughts about the two uh, concepts that we're going to be presenting because we want to start to undertake construction this year, followed by a next phase of construction in future years. Uh, next slide. So for construction this year, um, because we have a short design timeline and also construction window, some of the elements we're thinking about constructing include pathways, pedestrian lighting, event power, uh, earthworks or moving around the land, roads and parking lots, as well as potentially affecting the lookouts. Next slide. So for future construction, um, because we do need more time for design and for approvals, we're thinking about including shoreline treatments, uh, benches, welcome circles, and I'll talk to what those are in a minute. Um, special moments, signage and wayfinding, art, plant material, more earthworks, and also below grade infrastructure. So the history of the site, Nistawayu, where three rivers meet. So the first inhabitants had a strong spiritual connection to the traditional lands. The waterways, shorelines, and lands have been central to the identity, lives, and cultural continuity of Indigenous people as long as the ancestors have resided in the area. The area provides substance, economic needs, a meeting place, spiritual and cultural well-being and mobility. Moccasin Flats, uh, the Métis families were evicted from the land in the 1970s to the early 1980s. The Métis families and the communities have suffered intergenerational effects of the eviction and disconnection from the land. We had many guiding documents to help us come up with the two concepts that we're going to be discussing. There's several on the screen here, but there was about 25 different documents that we did uh, read through to help inform the, uh, the concept design. Next slide. There are many great existing conditions and uses that we are looking to foster and to reinforce, including all season use and touching the water in different ways and also taking advantage of the, the beautiful landscape and surrounding landscapes. Next slide. And a big factor that we do need to um, keep forefront in our mind is that um, the park does flood and we need to think about the materials that we're going to be using and how the design can work with this flooding because it's something that we can't stop but we need to work with. There are certain things that we can do easily on the site and there's other things that are more challenging or that we're looking into. Some of the things that we can build on the site are pathways, uh, pedestrian lighting, roads and parking lots and plant material. Some of the things that we are having conversations to understand how we can or if we can build on the site include permanent open air structures, hydro for events, potable water service and connection to stormwater and sanitary systems. So before we began this project, um, there was a lot of engagement that happened with the RMWB and Lees and Associates. And there's two slides here to summarize some of the um, some of the things that we've heard. Um, through the Indigenous engagement, we heard that this park should be a gathering place that is physically and financially acceptable, uh, accessible to Indigenous groups, that it acknowledges Treaty 8, the unceded Métis territories and local Indigenous language, that it connects to the water and provides an opportunity for Indigenous art, history and storytelling, and also recognizes the history 
of the Métis, Treaty 8, and Moccasin Flats. Some of the um, feedback that we heard through the stakeholder engagement include that the park should be a gathering place that is welcoming to all ages, abilities, and genders. It provides a community space that Fort McMurray and the surrounding areas can be proud of, that it's flexible and works with flooding, and that it enhances the natural beautiful landscape. It's a community driven design and that it supports truth and reconciliation. Some of the guiding principles, I'm going to go over these uh, rather quickly. This presentation will be available for you online, but these are some elements that help to guide us in the development of the master plan design to make sure that we are achieving everything that we want. Um, so we do know that this needs to be a four season waterfront space that is a key destination for residents and visitors and that it provides con uh, continuous integrated cultural experiences. That it touches the water and allows for touching of the water. It has integrated public art and it builds and strengthens the flood mitigation. We also want to make sure that it takes into consideration all of the great work that's already been done and the past guiding documents, that it represents Indigenous communities, that we work collaboratively collaboratively with the design development and that we represent the larger diverse community and support both place making and place keeping. But master plan elements. So these are several elements that we thought about and that pulls all of the different elements together and some of those guiding principles and guiding documents um, to be able to connect to connect people to the water to connect people uh, together and to really um, strengthen um, the idea of community with this park development. Place keeping is really important and again to have meaningful place keeping that is relevant to the different communities. Activate. So this is both for large events to be able to support those, but also to function on a quiet day and for day to day activities and to feel very comfortable within that space. Diversity. So this is both um, supporting different users and the diversity of users that will come to this park, but also thinking about the biodiversity and working with the landscape. And resilience, because we know this is going to flood, being able to support and work with the landscape and the floods that happen to uh, really support what the community needs this park to do. Thinking about innovation, so wrapping a resilience into this and thinking about bioswales or other ways of managing stormwater that are low impact and potentially using reinforced turf to help support some of those great activities and events that can happen in the space and to also think about the maintenance and um, the long term cost to the space. Priority one area, the concept plan. So this is where it gets fun. We're going to be presenting two options. The first option is called Clearwater Commons. The intention with the names are not that we want to rename the parks, but it's a way of identifying between the two options. Option one and option two have many similar uh, features. Some of those similarities include the Great Lawn, which is the number two, which is shown as a circle, which can be also used as a ceremonial space. That is also supported by an amphitheater slope that connects Clearwater Drive down into um, the park, into the lower area that floods. All of the pathways that we're proposing would be fully accessible and there would be, um, yeah, the accessible pathways that would be connecting the parking lot. There's also um, the reconciliation trail and pedestrian pathway that would run along the water's edge and continue uh, south as well into the future uh, phase two of the waterfront master plan area. Sny Point would have a fire pit and a welcome circle and we will talk a bit more about what that means, but it's a space that would be able to function as it currently does, supporting fishing activities, uh, community gathering, 
in option one, we have a vehicular um, uh, roadway that would be connecting the hardened street to the parking lot and then continue um, through Snai Point to the parking lot. And Morimoto Drive would be in its current um, configuration uh, along the water's edge. The number five represents um, there's two beaches on either side of the existing boat launch, which is shown in its current location. There's three docks that are being proposed on the plan, which um, the municipality may be installing this year. So that's to support some of the touching the water activities. Maybe we'll flip to the next plan, which is zooming in just a little bit where we can talk about um, the flexible use areas, the number six. These are areas that would be um, mown lawn surrounded by trees to help um, give a little bit of a definition to the space. But these open lawns can be used for throwing frisbees or having picnics, um, but they can also help to support some large event areas. Um, so if there's tents that are, would be set up or um, some kind of fair, they would be able to be a large space that can be activated. Um, some other features, um, there's by Sharika's, there's the two lookout spaces that we would be looking to accentuate and to really um, celebrate. There's the existing parking lots that we would be looking to put some bioswales in to help with stormwater management and to potentially expand some of the parking spaces there as well. Maybe we'll go to option two next. We call Sny Landing, and again, it's not to uh, rename the park, but just to show the differences between the two. So Sny Landing has many of the same features, including the reconciliation uh, pathway along the water's edge. There would also be a cycle trail that would be different from the pedestrian path that would be parallel to reconciliation trail. There's still the boat launch and the two beach areas on either side of the boat launch. There would also be Sny Point um, with a welcome circle and a fire pit with the fire on the ground. One of the key differences is that the roadway connection between Harden Street parking lot and Father Merck parking lot would be more of a periodic use instead of a full access vehicular link. So they would provide um, some lay-by spaces for people, but this would not be used as an everyday access. It would be used for emergency vehicles um, or for setting up events, or if there's a person with um, mobility challenges to be able to access uh, Snai Point and be dropped off. The other significant difference is Morimoto Drive is pushed to the south side closer to Clearwater Drive. And what that does is it creates more of a continuous pedestrian space and connection to the water. So if there is a large event, um, you're not going to be crossing traffic to be able to get to the water's edge and it creates a larger pedestrian environment. Maybe we'll go to the next slide that also zooms in a little bit, but we see some of those accessible pathways, which is common between the two schemes and links the water's edge to Clearwater Drive and to the larger uh, Fort McMurray Center. And we also see some differences between the manicured lawns and the open meadow, meadows. And there's a slide that we show some of the different kinds of landscapes, but we are thinking about the biodiversity in the land as well. Next slide. So this diagram outlines some of those differences that I was speaking about. Um, so the two key differences are Morimoto Drive and option one, Clearwater Commons. It's in its current location. We see the connection to Harden Street and those two pedestrian areas in orange are separated by Morimoto Drive. In option two, Morimoto Drive is pushed to the south towards Clearwater, and then we see the larger continuous pedestrian space that stretches from Morimoto Drive to the shoreline. And then also the connection between the Harden Street parking lot and the um, Father Merck parking lot. In option one, it is a defined and fully open vehicular connection um, to the point with a little bit of parking there. In option two, it would be a periodic vehicular use that would be connecting the space. So it wouldn't be open to regular traffic and it helps to create a more continuous pedestrian space within the Great Lawn straight to the point. Next slide. 
So the following sketches are an idea of what it could be like to be within the space. And this is still very conceptual, so we are looking for your comments to help finalize the design. Next slide. So a welcome circle, uh, this is an example of what it could look like. It would have signage and lighting, and it would connect the pedestrian trail and the bike trail. And three of the five welcome circles would have a fire pit with fire on the ground and helped with those connections to the water. And we also see some new plant material as well. Next slide. And then we see at the amphitheater, so talking about those accessible pathways, this would be a gentle slope that would connect the Clearwater Drive elevation down to the water elevation. So there would be some seating um, integrated, a lookout, and this also would provide an opportunity if there is a large event that uh, folks can sit on the um, hillside and enjoy um, facing the stage and the performances. Snye Point uh, would also have a welcome circle. So this would also have a fire pit uh, with fire on the ground, supported by some seating and some plant material. And here we are looking north um, towards McDonald Island. And the flexible use areas, um, again, which could be used for you know, kicking a soccer ball around or playing Frisbee, but it's also a space that could help to support um, like a book fair or a craft sale and people can set up tents and um, it could be surrounded by trees and potentially some art, but it helps to create a different kind of space and one that can also help to facilitate large events. In the background, we see a taller um, marker pole and we have a diagram coming up. These poles are intended to help connect and be a visual icon between the city that links people to the waterfront park and then to the shoreline as well. And this is our last mood sketch, but this is the idea of the beach. And we see there's the reconciliation pedestrian trail closer to the water and a separate bike trail that potentially has a bioswale or somewhere where stormwater can be soaked away. We see an idea of signage and seating with benches and armrest. Um, so we would have different kinds of seating incorporated in the design. And these elements haven't really been worked out, but through your feedback, we're gonna be moving forward with the preferred concept. The other element in here is an opportunity for vendors. So perhaps having several of these um, temporary um, shells that can be used to support either food or beverage or uh, stand up paddleboard rentals or snowshoe rentals in the winter. So again, thinking about that four season use. Next slide. So the diagrams, I'm going to move through these quickly because we want to make sure that we can hear your feedback. Um, the first diagram is talking about those accessible pedestrian pathways. So all of the connections right now we're proposing would be fully accessible. So they would be made up of smooth uh, surfaces that um, either baby buggies or um, different mobility devices can use without trouble. Uh, we see a five minute walking circle, which helps to give an idea of the size of the site. Those red marker poles, um, which again haven't been designed, but are a way of connecting um, the town to the park. And then within the park, being able to have the marker poles both on the north and the south side to connect to the water. Next slide. And again, this hasn't been designed, but the idea that there's different kinds of signage and different ways of recognizing um, different types of information on the site. So the first could be a wayfinding to understand that this is a regional park and um, also have some local maps. Signage that could talk about storytelling, history and about the future. Um, some signage that would be able to share information about plants, animals and the environment. And we're also proposing that um, aside from English, that there would be Machif, Cree and Dene languages integrated into the signage. Next slide. 
Placekeeping is an essential component that we want to make sure is integrated into the site. Um, a few ideas we have are the reconciliation trail, which would be connecting from the future Métis Cultural Centre down to Marine Park. Um, being able to have accessible fire pits within um, the park, so those are the three red circles. Having art, both temporary and permanent, and traditional and ceremonial Indigenous plants included. Next slide. And washrooms, we've heard um, strong support for washrooms. Um, this is one possible location, uh, which is at the same elevation as Clearwater Drive. So it's outside of the floodplain. And again, we need to look into if this location is feasible to be able to connect, be connected to the services and if this location actually works. But this is one idea. Next slide. And we have it on good authority that there is a tremendous toboggan slope um, within the park. So we are looking to keep that and make sure that it is still going to be lots of fun. Next slide. Lookouts and welcomes. So welcome nodes. There's two existing lookouts, the number three icon or the purple axes. So we would be looking to celebrate those and keep those. As mentioned, there's the five welcome nodes. The three um, red ones shown on the screen would include fire pits with fire on the ground. And the two blue ones would be, um, ultimately all of the welcome nodes would be areas where people are either entering the park or there's special moments uh, within the park to be celebrated. Next slide. We know that there's some really great fishing opportunities here and we are looking to make sure that they remain and um, that it's still a really great uh, activity either by yourself or with some friends. And those are some of the blue areas. So we know uh, Snide Point is a, a great location and apparently there's Pickerel, which is amazing. Um, and then the three other blue dashes are where the um, proposed docks would be. The red squares shown on the screen are where those vendor opportunities are. In the one mood sketch, we showed a bit of a sort of half of a shipping container, but again, thinking about all season use and being able to support different kinds of rentals or food and beverage potentially. Next slide. So I won't get into the different kinds of landscapes too much um, because this is something that we need to develop moving forward. But the idea that we would be having beaches, that we'd have lawn areas and meadows and more tree groups um, to help shape the space and to create um, different kinds of feelings and moments within the site. Next slide. So vehicular circulation, we are showing um, the first option here, but the idea that there would be the existing Morimoto Drive connection, whether it is in its current location or if it's moved to the south, we would be looking those number two parking lots of potentially expanding some of the parking availability. The number three would be a flexible parking lot space that could have reinforced turf. So if there is a large event, it uh, could uh, support parking or it would just be an open lawn area that could also um, support fun family activities. Next slide. So event hosting, um, this is the Snipe Point outdoor event space. So it needs to be able to function both on a quiet day and also for large events. Um, the number five symbol by that orange dot is about the size of a space for about 1200 people to gather and there would be the stage there. Thank you very much, James, um, with a supportive back of house. So that's where the performers could be, um, where they can secure musical instruments um, and to really let the performers be able to be relaxed um, when they're on stage. The number three at the dark boxes would be um, some things that would be able to support the events, whether it be washrooms or food and beverage. So thinking about the number of people that are there, making sure they're comfortable. Um, there would be the um, access uh, that would be able to support getting those big trucks down there, whether it's option one or two, uh, that uh, vehicular road connection would exist. The number two is the idea of a drop off. If there is a really large event, people could get to the site safely and then also back home. And the number one area is the flexible use area. So again, this would be um, open grass areas where either arts and crafts stalls could be set up or different supportive events or even a totally different event happening at the same time. 
next steps and discussions. And I'll quickly just touch on um, the next step. So we are right now talking to you about um, the first iteration of concepts. And again, we still have a ways to go and are looking forward to your feedback. Um, there is an online survey uh, right now, and we are right now in our first virtual open house. So we're going to be taking your feedback and refining the design um, through March into April to come up with the preferred concept, which we look forward to coming back and sharing with you in April and hearing your thoughts on that preferred concept and then starting the first phase of construction um, in the summer this year. I'll hand it over to Megan. Thank you so much, Yvonne, for that detailed presentation. Now we understand that was a lot of information provided in the presentation, uh, but we are now really hoping that we can respond to some of your questions. So if you haven't already, please do enter some questions and or feedback in the Q&A chat uh, and our subject, expert, um, subject matter experts are really happy to address uh, your questions. So the first one um, is from Anonymous. Can I'm going to call Yvonne to answer this one. Can you pinpoint, I know we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, but can you pinpoint the biggest difference between the two concepts? Oh, and Yvonne, I'll just ask you to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Um, so James is uh, flipping to the slide. Um, this is the main difference between the two concepts are Morimoto Drive, the location. It's currently um, closer to the Sinai River um, and that's shown in option one. Option two is proposing to relocate Morimoto Drive to the south which would have a larger um, pedestrian area that would connect um, from Morimoto Drive straight up to the water. So thinking about if there's larger events that um, people wouldn't necessarily need to cross a road to be able to get from those flexible use lawn areas to the water's edge. The other big difference is um, the vehicular connection. So if people wanted to sort of use the site more um, like it is right now and be able to drive their cars to Sny Point and park. Um, option one is much more similar to the existing use. Option two is thinking about um, that it's not necessarily open to everyday vehicles, that it's a periodic use. So basically that space would become more pedestrian focused and less about cars that would still provide uh, emergency access um, and also potentially if people are um, physically challenged to, to be able to reach Sny Point uh, for an event or um, that would be open to them, but otherwise it'd be closed to everyday traffic. So those are the two big differences. Thank you, Yvonne. That's one of uh, the number one questions we've been getting asked through public engagement. So thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Stephen if you could answer this next question, um, also from Anonymous. Um, it's in regards to defining the project um, outline. So can you define the specific area that will be affected for the project? So. I know we're speaking about an event space, but it goes a little further. So maybe Stephen, if you could just elaborate on the entire project um, location. So this is the waterfront revitalization park project. So the boundaries go all the way from Tom Weber boat launch all the way to the Athabasca River going into Mac Island. Um, so that's the boundaries where we're looking at building a waterfront park. Within that, our priority set by council was to create an outdoor event space. So, you know, this is our priority focus. So we're trying to get this done uh, first, and then we'll be looking at developing the other areas of the park. Uh, as some of you may be aware, there's been some recent council motions about uh, connecting this to the Métis Cultural Centre at Mac Island. So we'll be working closely with that project to make sure that the rich and uh, Indigenous culture and history is represented along the trail connections and, and connectivity through that park. 
as well as we have that area along uh, the Mack Island Causeway along the uh, Athabasca River. So developing that area as a park space as well. So uh, primarily that's that's a project boundaries. So it's a lot of area to work with. Uh, we're really excited to have the community to share their ideas and thoughts on what they want this park to look like. Fantastic. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm going to go, um, uh, James, if you would be able to uh, share your camera um, in regards to a design question. Uh, can you elaborate? This is also from Anonymous. Can you elaborate what flexible use areas can be used for? James, I don't know, unfortunately, if we're still having um, microphone issues, but I'll um, I'll relay it over to Vaughn if you can answer that one. Can you elaborate what flexible use areas can be used for? Sure. So the flexible use areas are largely, um, they would look like lawn. Some of them may have reinforced turf to support um, a temporary parking lot, but they would be a, a large lawn area surrounded by trees. There's uh, additional um, pedestrian connections between Clearwater and uh, the Sny, um, but those spaces would be able to be used for picnics um, or you know, throwing a Frisbee around casual uses, but it would also be able to be used for events. So if there's a craft uh, market set up or a farmer's market or something, um, it would, there's spaces that are large enough to be functional to support um, those kind of activities or to be able to support, support a really large event where there's a stage set up in the great lawn, um, that number two on the screen, and then be able to have maybe um, a large food area and some of these flexible areas, which is uh, just west of Hardin Street. Um, so those are some of the uses that could happen in those flexible use areas. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, Stephen, I'm going to go back to you if that's OK. Uh, there's a question from Anonymous. Um, why is the RMWB focused on revitalizing or revitalizing, excuse me, the waterfront? So uh, as we mentioned previously, this is a council motion to create an outdoor, year round outdoor event site uh, here at this area, as well as the waterfront park revitalization project. Um, we do know that this is, you know, kind of the center focus and jewel of the community. They, you know, people are very attracted to water and there's a lot of demand to use this space. So we're, okay. uh, you know, we would like to develop this park so that we uh, create a destination for our residents as well as give them a lot of different types of activity as what you see with some of our recent events like winter play and that sort of thing. And to uh, develop that site for those types of events as well as develop a park uh, when there is an event that reflects on our culture, our history, history our indigenous components and, 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 and that rich history and culture as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stephen, for responding to that question. Um, I'm going to ask Maureen um, to provide some feedback with this question. Um, this is also anonymous. Um, it's in regards to flood mitigation, of course, um, the location being clo so close to the water. Um, the question is, Maureen, what has been done to protect the area in terms of long-term flood mitigation? Thank you for the question. Um, in terms of protecting the area uh, with long-term flood mitigation, um, I think we have to note that in that particular area, Clearwater Drive serves as the, the flood mitigation and the, the waterfront park that is being described would therefore be on the outside of uh, the flood mitigation. So during a flood, a bad flood, the waterfront Front park can be expected to be underwater. Um, I know that sounds alarming to people, 
but it is actually best management practices for flood mitigation to allow park space and undeveloped land to flood. Um, and as part of the, this project, I know that everybody is looking at um, things that would stand up reasonably well to flooding and ice, ice impact, or if not, if it can't withstand, it could be easily replaced. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Really appreciate that. Um, Yvonne, I'm going to go back over to you. Um, another question from Anonymous. How has infrastructure been thought of to support future community events in the space? So a question about infrastructure and community events. That's a great question. Um, so we are in contact with ATCO to understand if we can provide event power. Um, we were in contact um, before the Arctic Winter Games were rescheduled, but understood that there was about 40 generators uh, that would be necessary to support um, some of the, the events for the Arctic Winter Games in this area. Um, so we know event power is a really big uh, feature. And James just uh, moved over to the event hosting screen. So um, thinking through uh, the access, so we heard um, you know, that the site does get muddy, that there is some challenges with the vehicular connection. So being able to uh, provide those for setup, for efficient setup, thinking about uh, the back of stage um, to be able to have a secure area for performers and for the setup. Um, making sure that um, there's areas to support either TPs or um, things like portable washrooms uh, for large events. Um, and, you know, the flexible use areas as well, having, um, I just used the word flexible, but really uh, somewhere that is, um, that can do dual purpose to work every day as an open space, but also to support large activities. Um, and then, uh, we are also thinking about uh, potentially potable water, so drinking water, um, whether it's fountains or to support um, different events that would happen um, that need potable water. So we're looking into uh, different things and how to support uh, the park, both when it's really busy for a large event, but also for everyday use. So thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And I'm actually going to stay on you, Yvonne, because there's a couple of design questions we're getting. Um, this one's also anonymous. How do these concepts support history of the site? I know there was numerous items we went over um, in the presentation, but if you could highlight a few of those, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so, I mean, history is a really big, uh, important item. Uh, through some of the preliminary um, stakeholder and rights holder engagement, we understood that um, signage was a really big element that we can take advantage of sharing some of the history of the site um, of the area and the larger region as well. Um, so being able to have the different hierarchy of signage that could talk to um, the regional areas, um, thinking about the storytelling and sharing, um, and being able to have signage that um, is reflective of uh, the Michif Cree Dene language as well as English. Um, and then also uh, being able to talk about some of the plants and the animals in the environment, what it is now and potentially what it was in the past, um, and being able to share some of that knowledge. But um, so that's sort of the, the one element. And then also um, the idea of the reconciliation trail is another opportunity to integrate um, some of the placekeeping and placemaking and also the history um, and being able to have, uh, you know, really a, a great um, connection between the Métis Cultural Centre and Marine Park and maybe even to think about how the signage can really layer into that experience and really enrich it. Um, but those are several ways that we're thinking about integrating history into the site. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, I'm going to ask Greg a question. Um, again, from Anonymous, uh, in regards to uh, the area and location, of course, being close to the water. And the question, Greg, is 
What considerations are being taken to build a park on a floodplain? Can you provide an answer to that, Craig? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately, we want to design and build a resilient park. And um, Yvonne spoke to uh, some of the components in her presentation around, you know, what can uh, be built in a in a, a floodplain. And so, you know, thinking about uh, elements like pathways and lighting, uh, the roads and, and parking lot structures, and, and then obviously plant material, you know, are, are going to form sort of the foundation of, of uh, you know, those areas um, that can be flooded. Um, the other thing is, you know, just being mindful of where we're locating uh, structures. If we do have permanent structures, um, you know, keeping them in, in places that uh, would offer uh, more resilience. Um, and as we get into detailed design, uh, a lot of considerations uh, in terms of, you know, constructability of, of certain elements. Um, the materials we use uh, would also uh, play a big role uh, in being strategic uh, about uh, those pieces um, to ensure longevity and, and durability uh, of the built form components. Um, and then as, as um, Maureen spoke to as well, just uh, ongoing um, flood mitigation projects that are also uh, happening within this space that we'll be, you know, coordinating with um, uh, that will also in, ensure continuity um, in terms of uh, different flood protection measures um, as we build this park. So great question. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg. Um, back over to Yvonne. Um, this question's in regards to boat launches. Um, the question is um, from Anonymous. Um, I've seen numerous boat launches within the plan. Can you provide some details of what that specifically looks like? Sure, great question. Um, so the existing boat launch is shown on the plan um, and we do need to, as we move forward, think through uh, some of the connection pieces. But right now we are proposing that the existing boat launch would remain. Um, so that's, uh, you know, a well-loved uh, function both in the summertime and helps to support winter activities and access as well. Um, so that would be remaining. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, and I do want to stress that the Q&A um, portion is still about 10 to 8 minutes available. So do um, please provide some questions in the Q&A chat. All of our subject matter experts are um, super excited to be answering these questions to the community. So feel free to provide your questions in the Q&A chat or even some feedback that you have uh, for the concept designs. I'm going to go back to Stephen. Um, this kind of um, question is uh, relates to what we were speaking about in the boat launch question that Yvonne was just speaking of. Um, Stephen, the question is, will there be an impact to the SNI point boat launch due to this construction? Um, well, we haven't determined all the elements that are going to be going into the park yet. so. Uh, it's hard to fully understand what that would look like. If there were going to be any uh, construction uh, uh, activities that would impact that boat launch, we would certainly be working with our community uh, communications department to uh, advise the community as we do have other boat launches uh, that would provide access to the Clearwater River. Uh, with, with the construction for the outdoor event space, uh, there should be minimal interruption to the SNI boat launch, but there could be occurrences when we would have to, you know, depending on the types of construction that we may have to shut it down periodically. It wouldn't be anything different than what the community is used to when we do our SNI dredging activities as well, where we would have to, uh, you know, use the point for access and we uh, encourage our residents to use our Raphael Cree boat launch or our Tom Weber boat launch as alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for that. 
Next question, I'm going to go over to Greg. Um, Greg, the question is from Anonymous as well, and it's um, how long will construction take for this project? Sure. Um, thanks, uh, Megan. Um, we're looking at, um, you know, initially um, working through a scope for uh, our first year of construction here in 2021, um, but ultimately the project uh, is intended to span three years of construction. So through uh, 2023 to get through uh, completion of, of both of the um, the priority one and priority two areas for the, the full uh, scope of the park. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Um, back over to Yvonne. Um, the questions in regards to the stage, uh, particularly for the event space um, from Anonymous, has there been thoughts on what the proposed stage would look like in this space? If you could provide some insight, Yvonne. Yes, uh, great question. So we are proposing that um, there is no permanent stage um, be included in the plan and that would also allow for flexibility. Um, so either if event organizers wanted to set up a differently than this diagram is showing um, to face a different direction or if there's different kinds of uses or being able to use um, some of the flexible use area. So there's there's no permanent stage, but we would be able to facilitate different sizes of stages um, like the streamlined stages or sort of the, the transport truck sizes that the large ones or a smaller one. Um, so again, that's that's thinking about um, maintenance, about um, being in the floodplain and allowing for really the ultimate flexibility within the park. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. And I'm going to go right back to you. Um, it's in regards to a question for the beaches. Uh, so of course, th that's something very new to our community. Um, so the question from Anonymous is, um, beaches are available within these design concepts. Can you provide insight of what those would look like specifically? Sure. Um, so the beaches, um, we responded to comments of people being interested to have you know, a picnic on the beach or children to play on the beach. So that really kind of spurred um, the original inspiration and idea um, to support that kind of use. We show the two beaches on the east and the west side of the existing boat launch. Um, and so we are, um, and we have heard some comments about, um, you know, accessing the water and what that would look like. Um, so you know, we, we are thinking about uh, more of a family use space um, and something that would, you know, help facilitate kids playing in the sand and getting a bucket of water and building sandcastles. So that was um, the primary thought, um, as well as potentially uh, being able to um, have a point where stand up paddle boards or um, canoes or kayaks could be launched. And it's more of offering the accessibility of um, the larger park to the water's edge um, and not just being at Sny Point. So that that's the larger idea behind the beaches. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, we have just maybe two questions left here, being conscientious of everybody's time. It's almost seven o'clock. So if you do have any additional feedback or questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, Yvonne, another question in regards to the design from Anonymous. Um, if Morimoto Drive were to move, what would pedestrian connectivity look like? So I'm assuming they're meaning closer to the beach. So what would connectivity look like if Morimoto Drive moved? That's a great question. Um, so if Morimoto Drive did move, um, thank you, James. Um, so there would be that uh, connection uh, closer to Clearwater, but there are also um, additional pedestrian connections that we're proposing that would uh, sort of cut through and connect Clearwater to the water's edge. Um, so 
um, there would be sort of the, the larger pedestrian space ultimately that that would be between Morimoto Drive and um, in Sky. Um, and then that would it's um, we've heard some feedback in, in presentations that uh, it could be a safer area. Uh, you know, if there's a, an event and kids are kind of running and going between the water and and uh, in the lawn area, the flexible use area. Um, but ultimately, the function of Morimoto Drive would remain the same. Um, and again, that would be connecting to the Borealis Park and then also providing emergency service access. Um, so the function would remain, the location would change, um, but it would set up a, a bit of a different um, space and relationship of cars and people. So that's that's really kind of the, the crux of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, and this is going to be our last question for the evening, and it's great timing. Uh, and I'll, I'll let uh, Yvonne speak to it. And maybe, James, if we go to the last slide that talks about next steps, this would support Yvonne's answer. Um, the question is from Anonymous Yvonne, and it's just saying, when is this project happening? So maybe just to give uh, next steps uh, perspective again before we sign off. Sure. Um, so the next steps, uh, we are looking at um, finalizing the design um, over the next month or so. Um, we look forward to coming back and sharing that ultimate concept with you to gather your feedback. Um, and we are going to be proposing that first phase of construction happen this year. Uh, which is a really fast timeline. So again, thinking about um, elements that we can build within the construction season and also get permits for. So things like um, the pedestrian pathways and lighting and possibly grading. Um, so that would be the first phase of construction this year. Um, but as Greg mentioned, there will be subsequent phases of construction um, just because we do need to get some permits that take a longer time and also um, finalize the design and make sure that it knits into the larger um, priority area two of the, the larger waterfront um, uh, park, which uh, Stephen mentioned in the beginning of the design. So. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to some action on the site uh, this summer and the first phase of construction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, and it looks like we've come to the end of our time here this evening. Um, however, before we conclude this meeting, I did want to provide some additional information. Um, public in engagement is still available until March 28th. Um, and it's all available at rmwb.ca slash waterfront. Um, our public survey, story submission, and ideas page are all available to provide feedback on, um, as well as images um, of the concept designs. And we will be making this video available for viewing on the website in the next couple days. The next steps of the project, as Yvonne had alluded to for a project team, is to gather the community feedback and really refine one final detailed design for the Sinai Point outdoor event space. We're hoping to share that final design uh, approximately in April and then construction anticipated to start uh, summer to fall 2021. We'd like to thank everyone for their questions tonight. I'd like to also thank all our subject matter experts on the line tonight. Thank you for being involved in supporting the community we call, uh, we are proud to call home. Good night, everyone. Thank you.